What is up, Diesel Babe? Woo! <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I have my cheerleaders at the front. Uh, yeah. As the second last talk today, we are going into something that everybody loves, everybody hates. We are talking about front-end development, we are talking about JavaScript, we are talking about all kinds of interesting things. But let's get into it. Uh, a little bit about myself first. My name is Matthias Huhta. I run a so small software consultancy in Turku here in Finland, the actual capital of Finland. Uh, I am a passionate web developer or web platform developer. I do a lot of open source work around all kinds of stuff related to developer tooling in that sense. And I'm also a avid home brewer. I don't use Mac, I don't use brew. I actually put malt and yeast together and make great beer, almost as great as the beers here in Disobey. And also pick related, it's me in front of the biggest cruise ship in the world. We had a company Christmas party and I just had to see it. But yeah, as a small disclaimer, I'm not a hacker. I'm a hack, so to say. I'm a full-time developer. I work on a lot of boring stuff during the day and a lot of exciting stuff during the nights. So take that with a pinch of salt when you're seeing me mix up all of the terms on stage. Uh, this was my mindset a couple of months ago. If I'll just submit a CFP, maybe they'll accept it, maybe I'll get finished with my stuff. And I would like to coin a term which is gaslight-driven development, because that's pretty much the only way I get shit done nowadays, is by putting myself on a big stage and making myself program stuff together. And this thing was built in that way also. So uh, let's talk a little bit about scouting. Uh, I'm a huge StarCraft II fan. I play a lot of strategy games. And in StarCraft II, scouting is the act of trying to find your opponent's game plan and then acting accordingly to the information you have found on the stage. And I find that uh, StarCraft scouting and the information security scouting is quite similar in a sense. Let's go through a couple of steps about the scouting uh, Liquipedia page. So it's like the Wikipedia for nerds. So first thing about scouting is that we want to find the or uncover the enemy gameplay decisions. And when we put that into the perspective of information security, we are trying to figure out all of the nooks and crannies of the software, how it functions, how it's built, and how it's working under the surface. The next thing is we want to be able to re reveal all of the expansions of our opponent in strategy games. That means find all of the bases, find all of the hidden, hidden factories and everything. In InfoSec, it means we want to be finding all of the uh, REST APIs. We want to be finding all of the external servers they are calling to, and all of those small programs to have plugged into their application. Then we are built, scouting to facilitate a prediction of the text choices of our opponent. Again, in gaming, this means just we are trying to figure out what kind of a strategy our opponent is playing and then building a counter strategy to it. In information security, we are, of course, trying to see what libraries are being used, if there's some CVEs or some vulnerabilities built into them, and so on and so forth. And lastly, we are scouting so we can make actual, like, informative gameplay decisions. And, well, need I say more about the hacking part? It's the same thing. We are trying to make the best decisions when we are actually going against a ap application we are trying to break. And all of these steps have dedicated tooling already built. We have Zap and Burp Suit, which we can use to uncover the gameplay decisions of our opponents. We can see all of the calls being called from our API. We can see all of the uh, expansions there. Then we have tools like FFUF or other fuzzers, <laughs> which can be used to reveal the expansions of our opponents, which can be used to enumerate endpoints and so on and so forth. We have tools that help us facilitate 
a prediction of the text choice we have Wappalizer, which allows us to get some information about the web application, maybe a web server, everything, so we can actually have a kind of a fingerprint on our uh, target system there. And pretty much putting all of these tools together, we are able to build actual like informative decisions and informative uh, assumptions on our uh, target system, so we can just plug those together and make actual like smart decisions instead of like just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. So what kind of a build tool would be like worth building uh, to assist in like using all of these tools? And uh, a couple of years back, we had a fateful discussion with Joana here in the front row uh, on Twitter. I was bored one night. I was trying to figure out what, what I wanted to work on. I really liked working on developer tooling, and I was kind of out of ideas because I do the tools. I don't use the tools, so I, I need somebody else to come to me with a problem, and I, I want to solve it at that point. And Joana was like, he wants a tool that could evaluate JavaScript on a page and enumerate all of the endpoints on the page and maybe make some decisions based on that. And knowing Jona, I of course knew that he wanted to plug this into his fuzzing applications. And Jona was flabbergasted on like, how, how did I catch up to this assumption? Well, of course, I'm a hacker myself, so I told him I'm always three steps ahead of him. And well, Let's not get it twisted. Again, I'm not a hacker. I'm just a developer tooling developer. And yeah, so that's why we actually needed to go really deep into the rabbit hole on like, what, 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 what are we actually doing here? Like, it was a small proposal from Yona, and I was like, yeah, sounds cool. What do I do? <laughs> so uh, on my day job, I work in software development. I do work on recruiting software here in Finland. I do open source work around tooling. So a lot of stuff around the infra of development, front end, back end, everything around it. But and on, on my spare time, I do a lot of open source development. I do development tools for other developers. And I make <laughs> Vim color schemes and <laughs> other nerdy stuff. So, th But there's no hacking involved in any of these. Well, it's hacking together a lot of solutions, but it's not like actual hacking involved in these. So I was wondering where I should be starting. And I started where I knew, from the domain I knew well best. And that's through the applications themselves. I started dissecting web applications into smaller parts. Nowadays, everybody's uh, JavaScript developer, if you're doing front-end, 80% of the front-end code is JavaScript, whether you liked it or not. Then there's some sprinkled HTML and CSS there, and that's pretty much the web application nowadays, pretty much always. And if we dig a little bit deeper into a JavaScript side, we can see that the application code usually is like 60-40, 50-50 split between the application code and the library code. So the application code here, meaning the code we have actually written ourselves, and the library code being stuff like Lodash, React, and all of the bells and whistles people are NPM installing nowadays. And if we go a little bit deeper into the actual application code, we can see that the, usually the split is between you have your classic web application. It has a front end, and then there's an authenticated side, and then there's like some features that are for the authenticated users and some that are not, not for the authenticated users. So there's a split between those code bases. And usually, developers are too, uh, too lazy to bundle them different, uh, separately. So these are in the same bundle, whether you're authenticated or not. And even if it was a separate bundle, usually the assets are not be behind a authentication wall. So it has, as soon as you do the role can see the assets for the authenticated side, you can just like start hacking around those. And then there's the small green part, which is actually interesting, which is the abandoned code, because a lot of code bases have abandoned code, which is usually some test endpoint or some kind of a service that I may, may have had, maybe are implementing later on, and that might be just lingering in the code base. And we really want to find those because Abandoned API endpoints are usually the ones that have the biggest exploits, so we want to really be focusing on those. But we can take a look at a couple of uh, example pages 
well, this random page over here is a good example because in the case of disobey, we have quite an easy setup of looking at the JavaScript because it's written as the Lord intended in unminified jQuery <laughs> because everybody does unminified jQuery nowadays. But it's not all jQuery and rainbows in the modern web applications. It's always bundled, minified, bundled, minified, and then <sighs> I don't even know what they do to this nowadays, but it's always thrown through f five different pipes, and then there's some kind of a poo poo platter that comes out of that whole process. So that's like modern JavaScript for you. And you might be thinking that, yeah, I could just throw some regex at it and find some uh, like usable information out of my application. And well, as the saying goes, if you have a problem and you introduce rejects, you get two problems at that point, even more maybe at some points. And let's not even talk about introducing rejects into HTML. So let's, let's kind of ditch that idea. OK, let's not work with rejects. I tried. Don't try it. You're going to be at the bar late at night thinking why it didn't work, and it's not going to work. Uh, so I was working on a couple of toolings uh, one night, I use NeoVim, by the way, not VS Code. So uh, I, I was working on tooling, and I like to use debuggers a lot because console log based or print line based debugging isn't really effective when you're actually working with complex data structures. And while I was working with the debugger, I was usually trying to figure out how some variables became those variables, how some uh, function call was called, how did we get here. What are we doing here? How, how do we get out? And at that point, I was walking backwards on the stack a lot. I was work, walking backwards, seeing how the function calls were made, how the variables ma were made, where everything went, and how it became what it became. And at, at that point, I was like, there might be something onto this. Because if a stupid editor like VS Code can do this, why shouldn't I be able to do this? Like, it's all open domain on that front. And that's when we started looking at the actual like, problem sector here. So the idea was to enumerate JavaScript uh, endpoint calls and then trying to find what information lies behind those. And we have our fetch call here. Fetch is the way JavaScript calls to an API endpoint. It calls some endpoint. It has some dynamic variable. We might want to extract that variable for ourselves, find every way that function is called with that variable, find what variables are passed into those function calls, walk up the tree, see how those variables are made, and just go up until you find the actual solution. And I've worked quite a lot on developer tooling and language servers myself, so this was kind of a familiar uh, domain for me, because in language servers, it's quite the same thing. It's you try to find a piece of code, and then you try to walk backwards until you find the actual definition of it. If you have ever used a editor that could tell you how a function, where a function is defined, that's because it has a language server. So that's kind of the uh, gist there. And through these projects, I'm pretty familiar with just picking stuff apart and seeing how it ticks. So this kind of was a really good, uh, good thing and up my alley at that point. So I started picking up a couple of JavaScript applications at that point. And while regex is all fine and dandy, in most languages, we want to be parsing it through a actual like, intelligent structure, because you can write JavaScript in so many ways, and you don't want to be uh, parsing all of those ways and having handlers for all of those things. And that's where something called an abstract syntax tree comes in. An abstract syntax tree, try to say that three times fast while well, you're on the second day of disobey, so I'll be shorting it to AST from now on. So in ASTs, we are able to analyze our code in a smart tree-like structure. Every node of your code is a node in your AST, and every part can be analyzed. It has a tree-like structure, so if you have a function and you have code inside of your function, it, it's inside of that tree branch in there, and it's easy to walk, easy to analyze, and it, most importantly, it's easy for code and computers to understand. And with ASTs, we have a really clear view of what's happening inside of our code. It's, it has every single part of the code kind of like bundled together, and it, we have 
all the information we need about everything there. And for each node, the AST parsers might give you some different information. But for example, you can get uh, statements, you can get expressions, you can get locations in code, and everything you might be needing in your journey through these AST nodes. And while it can feel a bit overwhelming at some point, just looking at the ASTs, when you have <laughs> been look, working with them for a while, it's just you don't see the tree anymore. You just see the like calling structures, and you can see it's just a node that just maps in your head into a piece of code, and you can just kind of ignore the actual tree structure at that point. And with ASTs, the best part is that we are doing static analysis. We don't have to be running any of the scary JavaScript code on our machine or any other machine. So we are doing completely static analysis over here. And the best selling point here is that since it's a actual smart structure and not a regex, the AST is completely identical, no matter if you minify the code or not. You can change the variable names. You can change everything inside of your code. As long as the code's like functional structure is the same, the AST is the same. So we don't need to be fighting with minifiers anymore. We don't have to be fighting with beautifiers anymore. We can just analyze it in a smart tree structure and go, go, go with the flow at that point. So segueing back into the project I'm working on, it's currently in private mode because it's a hot mess I work on on the weekends. So it's kind of, I don't want, it. I, I believe in public, public or open source a lot. But while I'm really hacking around with it, I don't want anybody to be witnessing that because there's a lot of bad ideas and I don't want anybody to grab onto those. So it's going to be public as soon as it works. So let's go with that. It's named Lurker. Lurker kind of a callback to the StarCraft reference earlier. Lurker is a Zerg unit on the <laughs> game StarCraft, which kind of burrows behind enemy lines and then just like fucks up your whole system. And I want this tool to do, do the, pretty much the same thing, just hidden out of plain sight all of the time. And then it just goes kaboom, and you say GG. That's all. <laughs> and uh, with the tool, I have gotten a lot of stuff working already, so it's not just theory at this point. Uh, for example, yes, the code is visible. I was scared it wouldn't be visible. But for example, here we have a sample output of a simple test that is like kind of optimized for readability here. But we are able to map variables from our code into our system's output. And we can see, for example, that the fetch function is called with the different variables. And we can map those variables into the actual callees. And we can find the callees and then walk backwards, as we said, and find the actual variables there. And we can enumerate all of the different ways the APIs are called. And this is, this is like the simple case. This is not the actual like, difficult part. Like This can be actually seen. But what the actual output looks like in more like normal cases is that we have uh, we have the API. We have found the fetch call. We have found how it's used, how the variables are put into it. And we have enumerated all of the ways it's being called. And we have some kind of an idea of how it's being used by the applications developers and the users in that front. And even if we don't grab all of the use cases, because there's some pitfalls everywhere, we still get some kind of an idea of how stuff works what kind of a type there is in that API endpoints part, and what's like the patterns of using that endpoint by the application itself. And the thing is, while we are analyzing this with a actual language server and some ASTs, we are able to do even complex uh, JavaScript applications, because with regex, you are pointing something at one bundle, and you're hoping there's not a, another bundle imported into that bundle, or you're kind of, kind of, in a, in a pinch. In ASTs, you can just import all of the modules into the language server, analyze all of them. And even if the file changes, we can follow the file, follow the variable through all of the files. For example, here we have a do fetch call. It has a variable. It's being called with another function call. The function call is imported from another file. That file has an uh, exported function. It could be the different name. So at that point, all of the like clear, straight, straight cut rejects and everything breaks because it has a different name. It has a different name. It has a, another call into the return function. That has a variable that it's referring to. And it's still able to map all of that into the actual output of the program. So we can 
make clear decisions, we can find clearly how things are called, how things are kind of mapped inside of the code base, and we can just go through the whole code without like, pretty much having to do any heavy lifting ourselves. We can just throw the tool at it and let it, let it return something. And if we re need to analyze it ourselves, we can get the position in code and then go look at it ourselves. And again, these examples are unminified code because it's easier to read. You wouldn't be watching <laughs> a whole minified code base here. So, but you, when I say, when I showed you that the minified code base has the exact same AST, it also means that the output is the exact same. So if it's, even if, the, if it's bundled and minified, it works because it's a static analysis on the ASTs and not just like text in general. But there's always some pitfalls, like in every software project. Of course, web applications aren't completely static, so we aren't able to enumerate everything. In these examples, we, have, we had the sunshine and rainbows approach, so we had variables that were written into the code base, and that's about it. But with static analysis, we can at least enumerate endpoints, get the spots where variables are being used, and then kind of find or analyze the use cases ourselves. And through the analysis, we can maybe find some static points. Like, I worked with numerous code bases during my career, and there's always a lot of static values in the code, in the abandoned code maybe, in the actual code, in the test code maybe that gets shipped. Take pick your poison. It's always, there's always some static values nonetheless. But the dynamic values might be a b bit of a burden, but that's something that like, I've been working on and I've been finding a couple of uh, solutions for. And the next one is native APIs. Of course, the browsers are shipping native APIs that are not in like plain text. Plain text, they're just JavaScript that's evaluated on the browser. But with these, it's really simple because the native APIs are something that we can also use. We can just go on the website, open up a JavaScript console, and just write the same functions in there and take the output and just like go wild with it. And since we are doing all of the analysis in code, we can also just emulate that inside of the tool also. We can just emulate a browser instance on that page and get all of the variables and map them into our output there. Then there's the third bane, bane of my existence, which is uh, libraries. JavaScript libraries are a joke. You, like during the 25 minutes I've been talking here, I'm sure there's like three new state-of-the-art JavaScript libraries being published right now. So there's always a dime a dozen of libraries being developed for front-end development. But the fact is that even like no matter how far you are abstracting your libraries, uh, it's always one of the two endpoints on the like native API that it's always hitting if it wants to call a external service. It's either a fetch call or a XML, XML HTTP request, which is the old school way of calling an API. So they cannot rewrite the way we are calling APIs. It's always under the surface one of these native APIs. So no matter what kind of an abstraction you build on top of it, we are able to just dig into the actual like meat of things. And then there's the fourth and worst thing that everybody hates, the developers themselves, because everybody has a different way of writing JavaScript. You might be having a different kind of a coding style. You might, like in JavaScript, you can return a function like five different ways. So you are not doing any kind of an, like text-based analysis on those code bases. But again, these things are kind of covered because we are just relying on the AST. We are just relying on the native APIs. We can just trust that the browser works how it works, and just we can ignore pretty much the whole developer landscape on, on top of that. But I've seen some wild shit, so that's why I kind of added the developers part here, because there's a lot of code bases that have kind of kind of been wonky to test this on. So yeah, the pitfalls, these are pretty much the only pitfalls I'm currently facing. And it's kind of a problem of just like drawing the rest of the fucking owl at this point. The, the software works. It has a lot of testing that I've done on it. I, it's, it has like clearly encapsulated fields where it's kind of like lacking right now. But it's everything is workable. Like none of the all, all of the theory that that's behind it is that I I just need to take a couple of weekends and kind of hack it together maybe. 
maybe maybe some more than just a couple of weekends. But yeah, it's like everything, all of the problem domains are something that are solvable. So we are able to just like finish this project at some point. So there's an actual future for this project. But on that front, I'm not quite sure where we are going with this project, if it's just a couple of weekends, like I said, of just finishing the project itself, or if it's going to take a lifetime to finish it. But on that front, it's, there's a lot of system it's already, systems it's already working against, so I can, like, I have a good proof of concept that it's working, but there's also all of these pitfalls I went through that kind of just need working on at that point. Again, I'm not a hacker. Uh, that's why I'm kind of <laughs> looking for some help with this, because I'm, like, I'm just a one-man operation on trying to build good developer tools and good hacker tools at this point. And it's kind of a, I'm currently looking for applications that could be used as a, like a testing ground to crawl through these, uh, these things. So if you have some good tips, hit me up. And I'll end this all with a mandatory Sun Tzu quote. I hope that this tool will be shipped in the way that it is able to kind of crawl through your, uh, I don't want to say opponents, crawl, crawl through your customers' web APIs on web services. It's always a customer. <laughs> Somebody's paying at some point. But I want it to be able to crawl through that without anybody noticing it at, at all, and then just really messing up the whole system by finding those endpoints and finding how they're called and calling them without anybody realizing how it's being called. So yeah, that was all for me. I want to thank all of Disobey for the whole event here. I've been here today for the first time, and I hope everybody has a great after party.